From Providence, Rhode Island, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and New York City, New York, the National Broadcasting Company presents the College Quiz Bowl. <laughs> Here at Transcribe is the All-American Quiz Game that matches against each other the varsity scholars of two great American colleges in the College Quiz Bowl. Tonight, it's Brown University, on the air from Providence, Rhode Island, putting their newly won Quiz Bowl title on the line against the varsity scholars from the University of Michigan, broadcasting from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And here in Radio City, New York, is your master of the quiz, Alan Ludden. Hello there, everybody. Glad to have you with us for another battle of wit college style. Tonight should be quite a contest. The University of Michigan has for several weeks been building a team which would be strong enough to knock off the University of Minnesota, which... Up to last week, it compiled the astounding record of eight straight Quiz Bowl triumphs. But then, last Saturday night, up popped a well-balanced team from Brown University and Pembroke College, Brown's College for Women, and they ushered the Gophers right out of the bowl. So, let's first meet those giant killers from Providence. On hand again to referee for Brown Pembroke is Russ Van Arsdale of station WJAR Providence. How's the team look tonight, Russ? Well, they look just as they did a week ago, Alan. Very sharp. I don't think that success has gone to their heads, however, so Michigan, look out. Now, here's the Brown Pembroke team, which wants to prove that last week was no fluke. Judy Thorson, Brooklyn, New York. Tom McCormick of Stamford, Connecticut. Jane Baltzell, Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Cal Woodhouse, Little Compton, Rhode Island. <laughs> tonight's Quiz Bowl story. Now, let's take a run out to Ann Arbor, Michigan to meet the competition, which we can easily do with the help of Michigan's referee, Pierre Paul in a station WWJ in Detroit. How are you tonight, Pierre? Fine, thanks, Alan. We've got an enthusiastic crowd here to cheer on our Michigan team. And now, to introduce themselves, here are the students who would like to make Brown's Quiz Bowl reign a very brief one. Harry Lund, Detroit, Michigan. Ron Wick, Plymouth, Michigan. Ann Stevenson, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Tom Dell, Royal Oak, Michigan. All right, we've met the teams in tonight's college quiz bowl. Now, Roger Tuttle, will you give us the rules for this battle of the intercollegiate brain? Right, Alan. The quiz is set up to determine how much these varsity scholars know and how quickly they can call upon their knowledge. And so we have toss-up questions. And this is the way they work. Alan Ludden asks a question, and the first team to signal that has the answer gets a chance to answer. When Michigan signals, you'll hear... And when Brown signals, you'll hear... Now, if the team winning a chance at the toss-up question gives a wrong answer, the question then goes to the other team. And whichever team gives the right answer gets a bonus question. Each question is worth a designated number of points. And the team with the most points at the end of the game is the winner and returns next week to defend its title in the college quiz bowl. Well, that's the way the game is played, so now let's play. Okay, and there's the opening whistle, and here's the first toss-up question. May I remind you that the team getting this toss-up question right has a chance at a 15-point bonus question, which comes up first tonight. All right, here we go. The toss-up question. In the narrative poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade... Alfred Lord Tennyson immortalized the noble 600. For 10 points, tell us, what poet immortalized the noble 300? Anybody take it? Nobody take it? Well, I... Can you take it, Michigan? Uh, Ron Witt. Yeah, two cities. Can you take it? Brown. We'll try Tom McCormick here. Uh, Herodotus. <laughs> oh, you were so far. I hate to tell you, this is kind of a trick question because it was Tennyson again. Alfred Lord Tennyson also wrote the charge of the heavy brigade at Balaclava. And that was the Noble 300. Okay, here we go with another toss-up question. An American judge recently defined cookie pushers as the State Department people who wear striped pants and sit around drinking tea and pushing cookies back and forth. We're going to give you ten points if you can tell us why the judge was angry. Brown. Tom McCormick here. This refers to Judge Clark over in the American zone of Germany who said that there were cookie pushers in the United States who were sitting around over tea and they had just ordered him out of his position and he said he wasn't going to get out. They can stop paying me, he said, but 
I'm going to stay. And you, he's still over there. You answered it right for ten points, and you now want a chance. <laughs> you want a chance for Brown Pembroke at a 15-point bonus question. Okay, Tom, here you go. Now, they'll bring in your whole Brown Pembroke team, because they can all work on this one. It's a very interesting one. For 15 points, we want you to tell us if Jack Benny, Wanda Landowska, and Pablo Casals had a jam session, what three musical instruments would be represented? Violin. Yes. Harpsichord. Cello. Right. Cello. And cello. That's right. Brown Temple working as a team for 15 points. Okay, here we go. Back now to a toss-up question. In the days of yore, King Arthur called his sword Excalibur. Before I finish this question, may I point out to you that coming up next is a 40-point bonus. So on your toes, Michigan, on your toes, Brown Pembroke. In the days of yore, as I said, King Arthur called his sword Excalibur. And Orlando called his Durandil. We're going to give you ten points now if you can name the famous golfer who calls his putter Calamity Jane. Michigan. Harry Lund. Sam Sneed. Can you take it? Brown. Tom McCormick here. Jim Demarest. Sorry, you were both wrong. It's Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones calls his putter Calamity Jane. Here we go back to a toss-up question. In the nursery rhyme, coming up still is this 40-point bonus, remember. In the nursery rhyme, hark, hark, the dogs do bark. All the beggars arrived in rags and jags except one. Now, for 10 points, what did he wear? Brown. Judy Thorson here. A velvet gown. Right for 10 points, Brown. <laughs> You got a chance, Brian. Judy. You want a chance for Brown Pembroke at a forty-point bonus question. You know now, if anybody on the Brown Pembroke team li- uh, can answer these questions, so work together on these as a team. If Martha Graham and Cinderella made a joint appearance, you might expect to see them at a dance. Now, for ten points each, at what occasion or activity would you expect to see the following pairs of people? First of all. Perry Mason and Clarence Darrow. A trial of some kind. Mason is a detective and Darrow is a lawyer. You're right for ten points. That was Tom, wasn't it? That's right, Tom McCormick. Okay, now here, what occasion or event would you expect to see Addie Bundren and Ivan Ilyich? Addie Bundren and Ivan Ilyich. Uh... A communist meeting of some kind? <laughs> Not quite. Anybody in the brown team want to revolution? Sports? A uh, party? Oh, hardly. Political conference? Hardly, I'm sorry. An execution? <laughs> no, it would be a funeral. Uh, uh, it would be a funeral. Uh, Addie Bundy... <laughs> Addie Bundren was, you know, the central character in Faulkner's novel, As I Lay Dying. And Ivan can be found in Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Ilyich. All right, you still got a chance at 20 more points on this question. Here we go. Now, what... A fair or what kind of event would be uh, concerned with if you saw Teddy Roosevelt and Francis McComber there? Uh, hunting, most likely. Right? A big, big game. game hunting. That's yes. right. Roosevelt was an avid big game hunter, and Francis McComber was the amateur hunter in the Hemingway short story, The Short and Happy Life of Francis McComber. All right, ten more points, Brown Pembroke, if you can tell us what the event or the activity would be if you were to see The Wild Bull of the Pampas, and Golden a, Boy. A, a fight. Wrestling. Uh, a boxing, boxing match. <laughs> <laughs> you almost lost it. That's right. A prize fight. Golden Boy was the boxer in Clifford Odette's play. And the bull is Louis Drew for a purple to heavyweight. All right. What's the score, Roger? Well, Alan Brown made good use of that uh, bonus question. They now have 65 points. Michigan is still to scratch, and we have 19 minutes to go in tonight's session. Good. Now, before we move along, though, maybe we'd better find out what the stakes are in this quiz game, Roger. All right. Each week, NBC will award to the school of the winning team a $500 gift to be administered by the college. Now, that may go to a scholarship fund or to a campus activity. And each member of the losing team will receive an attractive, dependable Whitnauer wristwatch, a distinguished member of the Longines Whitnauer family of fine watches. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. Well, those are the stakes. We've given you the score, Alan, so now back to a toss-up question. All right, now may I tell you that coming up next is the 30-point musical bonus question. On your toes, Michigan, on your toes, Brown. Here we go with the toss-up. Shakespeare wrote, If music be the food of love, play on. For ten points, tell us in which play. Brown. Cal Woodhouse here. Can you play know? is Twelfth Night. Right for ten points. Right 
Okay, now since we're broadcast, you want a chance at a 30-point musical bonus. And since we're broadcasting the first program in 1954, these college quiz bowl competitions, we thought that it, we ought to employ the word first in our first musical bonus question. So now, for a possible 30 points, we're going to ask you to identify three great firsts in classical music. You're going to get 10 points each time you identify the composition. First is in the title of each. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Symphony? Yeah. Right, for ten points. Brown's first symphony. Symphony. Okay. Mm. What is this? What first is in the title of this composition? It's say, it, prelude, say it, say it. Oh, it's the first prelude in Bach's Book of Preludes. That's right. The first prelude from the Well Tempered Bible. <laughs> <laughs> that was Judy, right? That was Jane Balzo. Oh, Jane, uh, do you know uh, why we know that melody so well? Yes, uh, Guno put an Ave Maria to it. That's right. All right, now what first is in the title of this composition? First piano concerto by Tchaikovsky. <laughs> well, that was the fast we didn't get the music. That was Judy's <laughs> But you got 30 points anyway, Ron. Thank you. Okay, the score is now 105 to nothing, so let's get going. Here we go with a toss-up question. Pantagruel was a giant who was so big that a whole army could take shelter from the rain under his tongue. For ten points, can you tell us the name of Pantagruel's father? Michigan. Gargantua. Right for ten points, Michigan. <laughs> And you want a chance, Michigan, at a 30-point bonus. A 30-point bonus. This question is about a bird, a flower, and an insect with religious tendencies. You're going to get 10 points each time, Michigan, you identify one of these. First of all, for 10 points, the flower, which might have been a preacher. Jack in the pulpit. Right, for 10 points. <laughs> Okay, you'll get ten more points, Michigan, if you'll tell me the bird who could be an important priest. Cardinal. Right for ten points. <laughs> ten more points if you'll give me the name of a genuflecting insect. Praying Mantis. Praying Mantis. <laughs> right for ten. And you were right there on those. Okay, let's go back to a toss-up. On your toes, here we come with a toss-up question. A cow raft is a mythical hybrid that feeds in Bulgaria and gets milked in Moscow. For ten points, what common beast of burden is a hybrid? Michigan. Harry Lund. A mule. Right for ten points, Michigan. Yeah! And here you have a chance at a 25-point bonus. Now, this is a mathematical question. You're going to need your pencil and paper, so on your toes. It's worth 25 points. And we want you to start with the number of years that, according to the Bible, Methuselah was said to have lived. The number of... That's it. Work it out among yourselves. That's right. Uh, start with the number of years that Methuselah was said to have lived according to the Bible. That's important. Then add to that the date of the Battle of Actium. The date of the Battle of Actium. 31. Divide... Now, divide your sum by the number of winks in a short nap. And give us your numerical answer within a matter of seconds. It's not very hard. I don't think. What is the answer, Michigan? Uh, we've Ron? Got Ron with. Ron? Let's see, we've, we've got 23 point... Um, <laughs> no, I'm wait, sorry. Wait, wait, wait. It's an even, it comes out even the way we've got it. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, I think your time's going fast, though. A 24. You missed it by one. It is six, 969 years Methuselah lived according to Genesis 5, verse 27. 969, and of course, 31 B.C. was the date for the Battle of Action, where Anthony was defeated by Octavian. That equals 1,000. Then you divide that, of course, by the 40 winks and the short nap, 
and you get a cool 25. Okay, here we go back now. What's the score, Roger? Score right now. Brown, 105 points. Michigan, 50 points. And we have 13 and a half minutes to go in tonight's quiz. All right, here we go with a toss-up question. For 10 points, from whom did John Gunther get his book title, Death Be Not Proud? Brown. Jane Balsell. John Dunn. Right. John Dunn Thomas. All right. <laughs> Jane, you don't, you couldn't by any chance post that sonnet, could you? Well, I can quote the beginning of it. Say it. Death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. That's right, that's right. Now, Jane, you want a chance at a 15-point bonus for the Brown Pembroke team. Here it is. Anybody in the Brown Pembroke team? A lieutenant in the United States Bureau of Intelligence completed an important intelligence mission in the year 1898. For 15 points... What exactly did Lieutenant Rowan do? Is, it, is this Garcia? the fellow who brought the message to Garcia? That's the fellow that brought the message to Garcia, and that's right for 15 points, Frank. <laughs> Alan, that's the halftime whistle, which calls for a one-minute timeout. All right, and during the 60 seconds that I have here in this one-minute timeout, I'm going to do a thing many of you listeners have asked us to do, and that is to talk briefly to each one of these members on these two teams to find out what they intend to do after they finish their college education. I'm going to start with the University of Michigan team and start with Harry Lunn. Harry, what's your ultimate ambition after college? Well, after several years in the ROTC uh, active duty, I'll be a, a lawyer eventually after some time in law school. A lawyer after the Army, huh? Ronald, how about you? Well, after a stretch in the Army, I hope to come back and do some teaching. Going to teach. And philosophy. Ha- and ha- you're going to teach philosophy. I hope. Good. And what are you going to teach? I hope to go study abroad for a while and then come back and teach. You're right. I was right. You're going to be a teacher after all. Huh? That's right. Good. Tom Dell, what's your ambition? Well, I graduate in June. I'm planning to get married in July, and I think I'll go to med school in September. Oh, well, you've got your future well worked out. Getting married in July, huh? Yeah. All right, now up, up to Providence to the Brown Pembroke team. Jane Balsall, what's your ambition? You're a junior, is that not right? That's right. I'm a junior. Uh, what are you going to do when you finish college? Well, with a major like mine, which is English literature and writing, you watch the field. Of course, there are many opportunities teaching, writing, TV and radio, advertising, and so forth. So you'll take any one of them, huh? Judy, what's your ambition? Well, I hope to do graduate work in comparative literature and then teach comparative literature in either a prep school or a junior college. Very interesting. A teacher, too. Tom McCormick, what are you aiming at? Well, the first thing I'll do is go on and, and learn, a little, learn a little bit more philosophy, and then eventually I hope teach philosophy and write on the side in fiction and philosophy. Very interesting. Another teacher. And Cal Woodhouse, what's your ambition? I plan to teach Latin and history. Another teacher. Five teachers out of these eight. That's very encouraging for all of us with children to know that people like you are going to the teacher. <laughs> Believe me. Well, Alan... The minute's up. Time to get back to the quiz now. And with the score, Michigan 50 points, Brown 130 points, and ten and a half minutes to go in the quiz. How about another toss-up question? All right, here's your toss-up question. For ten points, in Kipling's story, The Elephant's Child, why did the elephant's child get his trunk? Brown. Okay, okay. That was a tie. We're going to throw it out. There was confusion. We're going to throw it out. It It was a tie. He got his trunk because he asked too many questions, of course, and here we come with another toss-up question. On your toes. Here we go. She was a Dutch dancer. On September 4th, 1917, the French shot her. For 10 points, what's her name? Another tie. Another... Okay, I got to call it a tie. Huh? All right, we call it a tie. It was Mata Hari. All right. I'm sorry, I, I, I missed the signal there. All right. What a hurry was that. Okay. You're on your toes now. For ten points, tell us the location of baseball's Hall of Fame. Brown. Tom McCormick here. Cooperstown, New York. Right for ten points. Okay, here we go with a three-part bonus question, Brown. In philosophy, if I said Superman and you had to make a flash association... Nietzsche. You'd probably say Nietzsche. You're right. Now, I haven't gotten the question yet. Oh, sorry. (laughs) That's all illustrative material, but you're helping me out a good deal. (laughs) Now, in each of the following questions, I'm going to quote an expression or phrase that is associated with a famous philosopher and ask you the philosopher's name. And if you do as well as you did in the illustration, you're going to do all right. First of all, the golden mean. This is, uh... Aristotle. Well... That's right. (laughs) 
Thank you, Mr. Allen. On a bonus question, remember, I accept the right answer when I hear it. And I heard it. The golden mean is Aristotle, the great moderator, felt that every virtue was a mean between two extremes, remember? All right, now, what philosopher do you associate with this expression? The best of all possible worlds. Leibniz. Right. Huh. Oh, Leibniz, Leibniz, Leibniz. <laughs> Leibniz, you're right, okay. Now, what philosopher do you associate with this expression? The categorical imperative. Kant. That's right. Email Immanuel Kant. Or Kant, as you may have it. The German father. <laughs> okay, here we go now. Here we go now with a musical toss-up. That's the more is riding high on the list of jukebox favorites. Several singers have recorded it, but this is the one that seems to be selling the most records. Now, you are to signal as soon as you're prepared to tell for ten points the name of this singer, but one word of caution. You must be prepared to answer immediately after you signal. Stalling on a toss-up question, you remember, or any kind of hesitation will force me to pass the toss-up question on to the other team. Okay? On your toes now and tell us, who is this singer? When the moon hits Brown. Judy Thorson here. Dean Martin. Right for ten points, Brown. <laughs> Man, that was fast. And we go from that toss-up question right into a musical bonus question. Right into a musical bonus question, Brown Pembroke. Worth 30 points, if you can get it. We're going to play three compositions by George Gershwin. And all you have to do is properly identify each. Ten points each time you give us the exact title of the Gershwin composition. First... Oh, that's right. Who is that, Jane? Yes. Jane, you're right. You don't let us hear much music, but you get the answer right in there. All right, you get ten more points if you'll tell us the name of this Gershwin melody. Let's hear a little of it, huh? Oh, yeah. Fascinating rhythm. Uh, Fascinating. <laughs> yeah. You want to sing it? That's our singer, Tom McCorvey. Okay, Tom. All right. Now, ten more points if you'll name this, this composition and properly name it by George Gershwin. Well, what? It's a prelude. No, right. It seems to be... Which one? A very... Right, listen. Oh, listen. I don't know. I'm going to have to ask you for the number of this prelude. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you got me there. All right, settle on a number and tell me. That's right, it is a Gershwin prelude, but you won't get to ten points unless you know Third, the Third, I... Best All right, I'm sorry that's wrong. It's the first. Okay, what's the score now, Roger? Score now. Brown and even 200 points. Michigan 50 points with six minutes to go in tonight's quiz, Alan. Okay, coming up next. Coming up next on your toes is a 50-point bonus question. A 50-point <laughs> bonus question, so on your toes. The first king of Israel was a Benjamite and was anointed as king by Samuel. For ten points, what's his name? Michigan. Saul. Saul, right for ten points, Michigan. And you got a chance. You got a chance thereby at a fifty point bonus question. Okay, Michigan, work as a team. If I said white watch whitewashed fence. And you had to make a flash association, you'd probably say Tom Sawyer, thus identifying correctly the fictional source of the famous scene. Now, for ten points each time, give us the name of the story in which each of the following appear. But there's one catch to this. You have only four seconds to make this flash association. First of all, a sleeping bag. Uh, oh, Henry. No, For Whom the Bells Told by Ernest Hemingway. All right. A torn shadow. Uh, Ichabod Crane. No, uh... Time. Peter Pan. I'm sorry, by Barry. Peter Pan. Remember Peter's torn shadow in the Peter Pan? All right. You've got 20 more points, 30 more points possible on this. Flash, a flash association. What do you think of when I say a purple umbrella? Oh, uh, Sambo. All right. Right for 10 points. Little black Sambo. All right. What do you say, what do you think of when quickly when I say a school for pickpockets? Um, Oliver oh. Twist. Right, for ten points. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. All right. Flash association now. What do you think of when I say a cigarette factory? A uh, Carmen. Carmen, right for ten points. Now what's the score, Roger? Score now, Michigan, 90 points, ground 200, and we have four minutes to go in okay. the quiz. Back to a toss-up question. Ten points. Name the man who is referred to by others as Harold... Uh, 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 
Sorry, you signaled before I finish. And I'll finish the question and go on to the next. Hardball Harry, of course, we we're going to ask you about the old curmudgeon who is Harold Ickett. All right, here we go back to another toss-up question. For ten points, tell us, where would you be if you stood at the top of San Gusto Hill and below you saw the central square named Piazza del Unita? Michigan. Florence. Harry Lund. Can you take it from... Can you take Madrid. it? Sorry, I'm sorry you both missed it. It would be Trieste, much in the news recently. Here we go with another toss-up question for ten points. In the game of field hockey, how many players on each team? Brown. Cal Woodhouse here. Ten. Can you take it, Michigan? Eleven. Right, Michigan, for ten points. <laughs> and you got a chance at a 20-point bonus, Michigan. For 20 points, Michigan, for 20 points, what famed ruler was the son of Pepin the Short? Charlemagne. Right for 20 points, Michigan. Charlemagne, Emperor of the West from 1800 to 1814. All right, here we go back to a toss-up question. For 10 points, who was known as the hero of Vicksburg? Brown. Bell Woodhouse. Ulysses S. Grant. Right for 10 points, Brown. You got a chance at a 15-point bonus, Ron Pembo. Okay, now you've got to remember your mythology. A maiden who always had the last word fell in love with a youth who liked only his own looks. For 15 points, who were they? Echo and Narcissus. <laughs> <laughs> right, Echo and Narcissus for 15 points, Brown Pembo. All right, remember your mythology again. Here comes another toss-up question of mythology. Try for 10 points and tell us. What was unusual about the headdresses worn by the three fates? Brown. Judy Thorson. Yes, Judy. Oh, hey, yes. They were snakes. They were what? Yes. Did you say snakes? That's right. Right for 10 points, and you got a chance at 20 points. All right, here you go, Brown Pembroke. For five points each, you were to tell us the colors of the following objects. First of all, Gillette Burgess's cow. Purple. Right for five points. <laughs> Edward Lear's Edward Lear's boat. Pea green. Right for five points. <laughs> Richard Llewellyn's valley. Green. Green. Right. How green was my valley? And Harvard's daily newspaper. Red. Crimson. Crimson. <laughs> <laughs> right for five points. Okay. What's the score now, Roger? Score: Brown two hundred fifty-five points, Michigan one hundred twenty points, and we have one minute to go. All right, here we, session. here we go with a toss-up question. Acton, Courier, and Ellis Bell were three very famous sisters. For ten points, who were they? Brown, Judy Thorson, oh. the Brontes, yeah. the literary Bronte sisters. That's right. But a short time we, by a quick speech, you got it. All right, the Bronte sisters. Those I uh, read off the name, the nom de plume they use. All right, here's a 15-point bonus, and it's our cooking question for tonight, Brom Pembroke. I'm going to read you a recipe for meringue. For 15 points, you're to tell us why the results would be a flop. First of all, you'd use two eggs, four tablespoons of sugar, and one-half teaspoon of vanilla. Now, what's wrong with that recipe? Well, you wouldn't use egg white. You wouldn't, you wouldn't <laughs> use the whole egg. You'd just use the white. That's right. For 15 points, Brown Pembroke. And here we go back to a toss-up question with a 30-point bonus coming up. For 10 points, what do Cotopaxi, Lamington, and Mauna Loa have in common? Brown. Tom McCormick. They're all volcanoes. You're all right for 10 points. They're all volcanoes. Okay, here we go with a three-part bonus question. Oh, I'm sorry, Alan. Time's up. We'll have to save that bonus for next week. But the game is over for this week, and the final score in tonight's college quiz bowl is 120 points for the University of Michigan and 290 points for Brown University, tonight's winner. <laughs> to each member of the University of Michigan team, it's our pleasure to award an attractive and dependable Whitnauer wristwatch, a distinguished member of the Longine Whitnauer family of fine watches. Since 1866, makers of watches of the highest character. For fielding the willing team tonight, Brown will receive a $500 gift to be administered by the college. And these varsity scholars from Brown Pembroke will return next week to compete in this new All-American quiz game with the varsity scholars of Georgetown University at Washington, D.C. And now here once again is your master of the quiz, Alan Ludden. Well, may I congratulate the team from the University of Michigan, Harry Lund, Ronald Witt, and Stevenson and Tom Dell. You did a great job. And may I also thank... 
The wonderful team at Brown Pembroke, Jane Balto, Judy Thorson, Tom McCormick, and Cal Woodhouse. You were wonderful, and next week you're going to meet Georgetown University. In the weeks to follow, we'll have varsity scholars from Ohio State, Trinity College, Indiana University, Smith College for Women, and other outstanding colleges and universities all over the nation. So won't you be with us again next week and every week for an exciting game here in the College Quiz Bowl? Now this is Alan Ludden saying see you tomorrow on weekend, and so long, everybody. Your referees tonight were for Brown Pembroke, Russ Van Arsdale of Station WJAR in Providence, and for Michigan, Pierre Paulin of Station WWJ in Detroit. College Quiz Bowl is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production, originated and produced by John Moses and Don Reed, directed by Ken McGregor. This is Roger Tuttle speaking.